Do you want to impress the examiners on those six mark analysis questions and feel confident when you're looking at an exam question and you're like, what is that graph showing me? Which does happen at A-level. Then I've got a technique that you can use. It's foolproof. You can use it going forward for all your data analysis questions and it can help you achieve the top marks. So in this video, we're going to talk about what does analysis mean in terms of geographical data and what are the examiners asking you to do. I'm then going to give you a technique that you can use for every analysis question going forwards. We're then going to do a worked example together and look at a model answer so you know what a successful answer looks like. And then to end, I'm going to go over loads of different types of graphs and geographical data and give you my top tips on interpreting them. I'm also going to talk about what happens if a stats test comes up um, so you can feel confident in interpreting that and also how to approach qualitative data when you're asked to analyze it. Hey, it's Ellie. And if you're new to my channel, don't forget to hit subscribe for exam techniques, revision content and live interviews. six mark analyze question. So what exactly is this question? So this question, analyze the data, comes up three times in each paper, your human paper and your physical paper. It's six marks and it's a data stimulus question, which means you get given some geographical data and you have to interpret that. It is just AO3, which means it's just skill based, you do not need any knowledge. You do not need to put in case studies or any extra information. You get seven to eight minutes to answer this question. So that's about one to two minutes interpreting the data that you get given. And then you have about six minutes to write up your findings and your interpretation. I actually really like this question. I think it is quite challenging because you never know what you're going to get. Um, some of the graphs are so interesting and I'll go over some tips for some what do you do when you don't really know how to interpret it. But I also think it's quite fun. There's not really much pressure based on it because you don't have to remember case studies. You don't have to add in information. So I always think they're quite challenging, but quite fun. And I really enjoy practicing them with students. So hopefully you'll get some good tips on how you can practice these going forwards. The main thing is, though, make sure you can spot the question. Usually they say analyze the data in the figure. So in figures one and figures two, or just analyze the data in the figure. However, it might use a slightly different command word. What it will not say, and this is important for recognizing it, it will not say using the figure and your own knowledge. Because remember, this is an AO3, a skills based question. So they don't want you to put in your extra information. So you are looking for the six mark question that is not using your own knowledge. So what exactly is it? According to AQA on their command words, they say analyze is to break down the content of a topic or issue into its different elements in order to provide an in-depth account and convey an understanding of it. That doesn't really tell you how to analyze. So let's have a look at what the mark scheme says on a common six mark kind of question um, in the mark schemes you get when you look online. First of all, the mark scheme clearly shows us it's AO3. And as I mentioned earlier, this means it's skills based and it's based on a stimulus resource. You get given some geographical data like most of a level geography, apart from your four mark question. This is the level marked, which means that you either have a clear or you have a basic answer. So we're always looking for you to get into the top marks. And this is what this video is focusing on, how you can get into that top level of four to six marks. So to achieve four to six marks on an analyze question, you need to have clear analysis of the quantitative evidence provided, or it could be qualitative. For example, if it's in the changing places topic and you need to make sure you use appropriate use of the data to support, which means not just lifting the data, but using some sort of data manipulation. Then you also want clear connections between different aspects of the data. Now, according to the examiners, the examiners write a report and this is one thing they said which students did well on the six mark analyze question. And it kind of shows you the key for success. 
So the examiners have said, students scored well by looking at overall trends, making connections between the figures and manipulating data effectively in support. So that kind of tells us what we need to do. We need to look at trends, we need to make connections, and we need to manipulate data effectively. So to be successful in this question, as the examiner has just told us, we need to analyse the trends illustrated in the data, we need to manipulate the evidence or the data, and we need to make connections between different aspects of the data provided. What we do not want to do is we do not want to apply, we do not want to explain the data. We also don't want to give any extra evidence of other places we've studied, even if we know lots about it. And we certainly do not want to lift the data. The examiners want you to do something with the data. So how do you actually analyse? I really like Paddle as a way of remembering how to analyse and be successful. Other schools and other teachers use Tesla or different ways of remembering how to analyse. You'll probably see similarities with my Paddle um, one. So you can use this as a guidance, but you can always refer to the original one that you've been taught. So what does Paddle mean? P is for patterns or trends. Now, you want to think global or like the larger scale first for patterns and trends. If you were describing the graph or the data to your neighbour who hasn't seen it, you want them to have a pretty big understanding of what it is. Don't go into the minute details straight away. It makes it a bit messier to understand the general patterns. A is for anomalies or sometimes called outliers. So what doesn't fit the trend? What's interesting in the data? And I really like looking for anomalies. I think it's really interesting when you look at graphs. You can start to think about why that is the case, but remember you don't need to explain it in this question. D is for data manipulation, which I'm gonna come back to in just one second. And L is for links and connections. So can if you have two graphs, can you link between the data or are there any, any aspects within the graph that you can also link between? And we're going to look at how you can analyse two graphs, showing clear links between the two different graphs. Let's go into data manipulation a little bit more before we have a go at analysing a graph. Data manipulation. The examiners want you to do something with the data to actually show the trends a bit more clearly. My favourite one is ratio or proportional change. So how much has it increased by? How much bigger is one country's emissions to another country's emission? It starts to give an idea of scale and it's really useful for interpreting data. Another thing you can do is you can rank the data. So this is particularly useful if you have a table, um, you can see who's in the top three, who's in the bottom three, who's changed in that data, who's the largest, who's the smallest. So that's a really another favorite for data manipulation. And then you can calculate the change um, between say two timescales or between two places, um, just simply working out the difference. It's maybe not as sophisticated as ratio of proportional change, but it's definitely doing something with the data. And the most important thing to remember is to not lift the data. Lifting the data simply means kind of copying the data. Um, and the examiners, when they're marking, will actually just write lift. Remember, they look at the resource loads, they probably mark hundreds of the same questions. So they know if you're just using the same data, which is on the actual um, graph that's been given to you. So they're really looking for you to do something with the data. And this is why I think it's so much fun, these questions, because there's so much you can do with the data. There's not like, this is the right answer. There's loads of opportunities for you to get marks. So we're going to give it a go. We're going to analyze the data in figure one and figure two. Now I've selected some interesting data. This is migrants to and from Qatar in 2013 and 1990. So I picked this information because you might've heard on the news how there's lots of migration to Qatar, um, lots of jobs in the construction industry, um, lots of jobs linked to the Football World Cup. And there's also been a lot of inequalities with um, the migrants who've gone over there and the living conditions. And there's actually been loads of deaths in the construction kind of industry as well. It's a useful topic to look at, particularly within the globalisation topic, when we're looking at inequalities in global flows. And I think it is really important just to spread awareness of. So if you haven't looked it up already, 
definitely check it up. But I just thought that's why I picked these graphs for you to analyze. And they are found on populationpyramid.net. You've probably been on it at school. It's where you get amazing population pyramids. What we're gonna do first is we're going to analyze figure one, and then we're gonna analyze them both together. So you can see how I'm going to use links between the two graphs. Figure one, we can clearly see that a large amount of migrants come from India. However, that's not a pattern. That's just saying one country. Remember what I said, if you described this graph to the person next to you and they hadn't seen it, would they understand it? And if I just talked about India, then that's actually not telling me anything else about the graphs, or the patterns or trends within the graphs. So actually, when you're looking at countries, it's useful to think about regions and continents. And we can actually see that in the top 10, most of the places where migrants come from are Asian countries. However, we also have Egypt and also Sudan that are from Africa. So that is more of our general pattern. Now, in terms of data manipulation, we do want to tell the examiner that India is actually much larger than the other countries. We can see it's huge on the graph. It stretches all the way across the graph. So in terms of data manipulation, what we can do is we can think about what's the difference between India and Bangladesh. So we can calculate the range. And remember to have a calculator. <laughs> this is probably <laughs> the worst calculator ever. Have a scientific calculator, but definitely have a calculator in the exam. So I've calculated the range by minusing Bangladesh from India. I haven't done that to the like, single ones. I've just kept it to the nearest 1,000. So 577,000 minus 220,000. And I've got a number there. So that just tells us the numbers that dif is different. However, remember, it doesn't tell us how much bigger this is. And we can actually see that India has significantly more migrants going to Qatar than Bangladesh. So what's slightly better is if we think about the proportions. So I've divided India by Bangladesh and I can see that there are 2.6 times more migrants coming from India than Bangladesh. And that's a really good use of data manipulation. In terms of other patterns that we can see in the data, first of all in figure one, we can see that there's hardly any emigrants. So most migration is going into Qatar but also we can look at variation within the graph. If you have a look at the graph, there's a blue side and a pink side, which is male versus female. So we can actually look at the gender split in migrants. And I'm actually gonna tell this by eye. You might have a ruler, so you might be able to use that in your exam. But I would say that around 80% of migrants going to Qatar are male, maybe 20% are female. And within this, we can actually see there is an anomaly in Indonesia which is more of a 50-50 split. Um, we can also see an anomaly of the state of Palestine where, there are, where people are moving to and out of Qatar. Let's have a look at the answer I put for this and I'll show you where I've used Paddle along the way. Figure one shows a clear trend where Qatar's highest numbers of immigrants come from South Asian countries, including India and Bangladesh. So that's my general pattern. In fact, eight out of the top 10 source countries are Asian with only Egypt and Sudan as African countries. So again, this is my general pattern, but I've actually picked up on a variation within the pattern or Egypt and Sudan is maybe anomalies. India is significantly the largest source of migrants with approximately 300 and 57,000 more migrants than the second largest source country, Bangladesh, or 2.6 times higher. India is actually a source for nearly a quarter of all migrants. So here on the graph, I actually saw it was 24.69 down the bottom. So I have kind of lifted that, but another sum I did do was India has more migrants than Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Egypt put together. So there's many different types of data manipulation you could use here. There are no migrants coming from North and South America. Only the UK and Turkey are the source of a small proportion of migrants from Europe, combined roughly only 3% the amount of India's migrants. So here I added Turkey and the UK to get around 15,000. If India is 500,000, and so 5,000 is 1%, I worked out that was 3%. Another trend shows that there are more male immigrants than females, with approximately 80% of most migrants being male. An anomaly to this is Indonesia, 
which has an equal split of male and female migrants. The state of Palestine is the only destination for emigrants, which is an anomaly to the figure. However, almost 100% of the migration movement is into Qatar. So you can see how I've used patterns clearly. I've looked at anomalies and I've used data manipulation, which we talked about earlier. If I was looking at two figures, you could look at figure one and then figure two. However, there are two figures for a reason. So the examiner really wants you to make links and connections between the figures. And what we can actually see for the figures is that there's actually been a large increase in the amount of migration. So it's useful to look at the connections between the figures. I think it's more sophisticated than doing figure one, figure two, then links. So here's what I would write if we had two figures and the examiner was asking you to analyze both. Figure one and two show a clear trend with the highest source of immigrants to Qatar is South Asian countries, including India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. In both figure one and figure two, India is the largest source of migrants. In figure one, India had approximately, and I've used the same data manipulation I used earlier. And then I've also added, India was also leading in 1990 as it was 2.6 times higher than Egypt. Figures one and figure two had the same top five countries. However, in 2013, Bangladesh and Pakistan were both the source of more immigrants than Egypt, which was second. Um, and in 2013, there are now 80,000 more immigrants from Bangladesh than Egypt. So basically just saying how that ranking of that top five has changed. From 1990 to 2013, there's a clear rise in the total number of immigrants coming from all countries. For example, India's numbers rose by 4.4 times. So again, I'm linking, I'm showing connections between the graphs. I'm looking within the graphs and then comparing them. Another trend shows that there are more male immigrants than females, with approximately 80% of most migrants from all countries being male. However, figure one shows an anomaly to this, um, is Indonesia, which has an equal split, and figure two, there's an anomaly of Sri Lanka. The state of Palestine is the only destination for emigrants, which is an anomaly in figure one. However, in 1990, there were also a small number of emigrants to the US. So I'm hoping you can see how I've achieved that with Paddle. And this would be a clear answer in your level two, where you've analyzed the data, you've used data manipulation, and you've made connections. And that's all the examiner wants you to do. Also, you can see here that I haven't written anything about what I know about migrants going to Qatar. I haven't talked about the construction industry. I haven't talked about inequalities. So I'm really just analyzing the data. Really important, do not add in any extra information. Next, I'm just gonna give you a few tips. I'm gonna whistle through very quickly on different types of data you can get and my top tips for interpreting them. My top tip, for this graph, which is a proportional circles or symbols map. Now this is the same data I looked at earlier. We actually looked at earlier, we've just analyzed. I've just put it on GIS and I've made a proportional circles map. Remember it can be symbols as well. The most important thing is remember you can look at the differences or the proportion change exactly like we did earlier. Sometimes these maps are a bit easier to see regions and continents. So use this to your advantage, really look spatially at the data. My top tip for desire line maps. So this is the same data again, it's on GIS, um, but the widths don't mean anything, it's just the locations. Now, first of all, this can seem harder to interpret because you've just got countries, but my main tip for this is you can count the data. So you can say that eight out of 10 locations or 80% of locations are from Asian countries, 20% are from countries within Africa. So don't forget you can count them. Um, you're unlikely just to be given this, you might be given two types of data to compare, or I'm going to talk about it might be on top of a choropleth map. A flow line map, again, the same data we just looked at, it's just shown differently on GIS. This isn't the best version, my lines are slightly overlapping, so you'd be given a better version to interpret. Um, here, the width of the line shows how many migrants there are. So again, you can look at proportions. Um, it might be over two different years. So you might be able to compare just like we did earlier. 
this is quite easy for looking at it by eye um, on the thickness. Um, so you can see if it's two times the size, a third of the size, using that kind of data manipulation we've just practiced. My top tip for a stacked area chart. Now, I always mark questions and sometimes students do get confused with this graph. So the most important thing is that every country, you measure it like on top of the next country. So for example, China, which is the widest here, China is about 10 billion tonnes of CO2 emissions. It is not 27 billion. So you look at the width of it, and this is so you can actually see change over time and also see how wide it is at different areas. So you're looking for how much overall the world has like increased in steepness. So for example, from 1950, has there been any variation in the change? Has any places slowed down? Um, and just remember to add on the widths for each one. For example, Oceania is actually very small, although it's at the top. Um, it's not 36 billion. My top tip for Coropeth maps. So you're probably very used to using these for GCSE. Now, just remember that you're unlikely to maybe just be given a Coropeth map. You're probably likely to be given a Coropeth map and a flow line map on top of it. So make sure you're making links between the different types of data that you're presented with. And um, just remember to look at the darker regions and the, like, um, the lighter regions, and also look at variation within continents. So this shows child mortality. So which continents have a high amount of variation, for example, Asia um, and actually North America, which continents have a low amount of variation as well. My top tip for, and I, <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Marimekko charts. Basically, the axis are both useful for here. So you have the mean income or expenditure per day on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you have the population. So for example, on this graph, you can see the US has a smaller population, but a higher average expenditure per day which is compared to China, which has a much higher population with a lower mean um, per day. So you can look at any correlations um, or patterns with the width compared to the height. My top tip for scatter plots. Now, um, a graph like this has come up in the exams and it's quite similar to a lot of Gapminder graphs. The size of the dots or bubbles is the population size. So you can make links to the population size. Here we've got the different areas or different continents and also your X and Y axis. So there's quite a lot to interpret and lots of links and connections to be made within this graph. And we'll talk about scatter plots and line plots in a second, but you want to look at correlations. So positive, negative, and also remember to look at anomalies for this as well. My top tip for line graphs so this is different from a scatter plot. It might be measured over time and it's connect each dot is connected by one line. So this is per continent. Um, you can look at fluctuations or variations within the lines, um, but this is different from a scatter plot. So my top tip for scatter versus the line graphs, scatter graphs are a good way of displaying two sets of data to see if there's a correlation or a connection. You often have a line of best fit. If not, you can draw one. Correlations can be positive, negative, no correlation. They can also be strong or weak. So you want to be using those words in your analysis. You can also estimate values based on data. Whereas line graphs are used to show the change in a relationship between two variables over a form of continuous data, such as distance or most often time. Points are plotted in the same way as one would for a scatter graph, but they're joined together in a sequence. So you don't have a line of best fit, but you might have um, fluctuations when the graph goes up and down, and that's quite a good word to use. Just remember that usually the independent variable belongs on the x-axis, the horizontal line, and your dependent variable belongs on the y-axis. So sometimes I've had students like misinterpret graphs by mixing up the independent and dependent variable. This is also important for bar graphs as well. 
for example, one graph was like GNI on the x-axis, and then it was um, like amount of like carbon emissions on the y-axis. And so you'd want to say that like, as GNI increases, so does maybe carbon emissions, if the graph's showing that. Not as um, carbon emissions increases, GNI increases. So just be careful on your wording for that. My top tip for stacked bar charts, again, similar to the one I showed you earlier, just remember that they are added on top. So for example, this is the number of deaths by age group. And so 70 plus years, you're looking at the width of it. So that, for example, is 20 million in 2019. It is not 50 million for 70 plus years. Um, and remember to look at, again, variations or change within the graph. Where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? So within here, there's lots of links and connections you can be you can make just within one graph. Um, a slope chart, my top tips. Now this hasn't actually come up in the exam. I don't know why it wouldn't. Um, you've got gradients. So it, from you can look at the difference from one year to another year and then look at maybe which had the like the fast, the steepest kind of gradient or the, the biggest change. You can also look here at ranking data and different regions if you're linking to countries. So again, it looks quite interesting to interpret. Other graphs, so this or a similar graph has come up like this before. Um, this, the examiner will tell you how to interpret, but just as a top tip, your, for example, South Asia is blue. That is where your migrants are coming from. And the blue line, so for example, there are two thick lines and an, a really thick line going to West Asia. So for example, for South Asia, most migrants are going to West Asia and then internationally to Europe and North America, the kind of feeding into the colors. So you can look at where the most, the least amount of migrants, internal migration, external migration. Um, and if you get something you're not sure about, just take time to read the key, the scale, how to interpret it. So remember proportions. Um, over half of migrants from South Asia goes to West Asia. 15% go to North America. So you can start to look at proportions just by eye on a graph like this. Top tip for qualitative data. So you do get analysed questions for qualitative data. You might have photos, you might have images, um, you might have word clouds. So look at the front and the back of the image. Um, so the foreground and the background. Think about what's included, what's excluded. Think about these two images, what's changed, what's stayed the same. When was it taken? What's the date? Who collected the data? Is there a purpose for the data being collected? Just remember with Paddle, like the other ones, you do not add extra information. You only add extra information on the sixth mark that says, and using your own knowledge. And then another top tip, and I mentioned this earlier, but if you don't have numbers, remember you can count. So here, 80% of migrants come from Asia, 20% from Africa. So count and then use that to look at proportions. My final top tip is for stats tests. Now I feel there was a stats test in one exam, but I couldn't find it. But I just wanted to go over it just in case. So a null hypothesis is a statistical hypothesis in which there are no significant differences or relationships between the set of variables. So you're saying there is not a relationship. Statistical tests look to disprove the null hypothesis. So if you can reject the null hypothesis, this means that you can accept the alternative hypothesis and it means that your results are statistically significant to a certain level, might be 95% or 99%. I would hope it's not very likely you are going to get a statistical test. The most likely one is probably Spearman's rank. So just comparing R to the critical value, if it's equal to above, you would say, we can reject the null hypothesis, therefore the graph is statistically significant. So to recap, um, what to do and what not to do. First of all, use Paddle, like we looked at earlier. Analyze the trends illustrated in the data. Manipulate the data and evidence. Make connections between different aspects of the data provided. And what not to do 
Do not explain, do not apply any of your extra information, all your extra knowledge that you know, that your examiners aren't looking for that. Do not use evidence of other places or examples you've studied and do not simply lift the data. The examiners want you to do something with it. So that, hopefully, you will feel a lot of confidence with how you can go about it. I'm hoping that you enjoy them. All the data I found was from populationpyramid.net or our wild and data. I'll put the links below and they're really good places to practice. And that is everything from me. Good luck, let me know if you have any questions below.